Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the title of my newest presentation is Deploying IPA to Research Novel Phenomena. Uh, IPA, as you know, is an acronym for Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis. Uh, it was a approach that was uh, designed and developed in the UK at the University of Birkbeck by Jonathan Smith, uh, Flowers, and Larkin. Um, so what I'm going to do today is show you uh, the entire presentation uh, or the slides that I used for my own doctoral dissertation. Now you might wonder why I want to show you that uh, because I have the doctoral dissertation, the live event already in my YouTube channel. The reason for uh, sharing this with you is with the growing interest in IPA as a phenomenological approach to data collection and data analysis, I figured it would be helpful to throw some light on how IPA is used to research novel phenomena. Um, a lot of folks think that IPA is only used to uh, or deployed to research uh, phenomena in the health sciences, health research and the medical field. While that is true, uh, the majority of the studies are done in that field, but IPA is also um, an excellent approach to research novel phenomena. And so I'm gonna share with you a phenomena called negative capability which was uh, an expression that was coined by the famous English romantic poet, John Keats. Um, and I'm gonna show you soup to nuts, how I used that novel phenomena uh, and how I went about researching it using IPA. Okay, I think it'd be very helpful to those researchers, both novice and a little more advanced to see how a, um, a unique uh, phenomena from aesthetics, from poetry, uh, can be effectively uh, studied and researched using um, a phenomenological approach. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, John Keats is the poet, the young English poet, uh, who coined the expression negative capability which is when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without an irritable reaching out to fact and reason. So think of this as two separate sentences in one. It is the capacity for someone to be in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts. That would be one stem of the sentence. The other segment of the sentence is without any irritable reaching out to fact and reason. So, you know, as you well know that when you're in um, a state of perplexity, state of ambiguity, uncertainty, the mind reaches out to, to banish that state uh, so that you can get to a state of normalcy, to be a state of comprehension, a state of understanding, uh, and it's difficult at best to stay in that dialectical state of knowing and not knowing. So John Keats uh, used this expression only once to his letters, uh, to, to his brothers in a letter in 1815, I believe it was. Uh, and, in, and when he used this expression, he was actually referring to the Shakespearean ability to be in that state of mind. Shakespeare, as you guys might already know, uh, was a role model for John Keats, a young English poet in his 20s. You can well imagine in England, looking up to the stalwart, looking at this legendary figure such as William Shakespeare. So he was enormously inspired by Shakespeare's work. And in a moment of intense speculation, um, uh, this young poet came up with this expression. So I am taking this expression, negative capability, and doing an entire dissertation research, or have done already my dissertation on this, on this topic. So let's go to the next slide, the origin of negative capability. It was coined by the English poet John Keats in 1817. It suggests a peculiar capacity for containment, 
to live with and tolerate ambiguity and paradox and remain content with half knowledge. So how many times have you been in a situation where you're really perplexed, you're really uncertain, and you're called upon to hold that tension, hold that half knowledge, half knowledge meaning you, you know and you don't know, all right? It's very difficult. It's a cumbersome, a very perplexing state of mind. It enables one to tolerate anxiety and stay in uncertainty. So negative capability, when it is effectively practiced, provides one uh, a capacity to tolerate this uncertainty, tolerate, tolerate this not knowing, uh, in order to allow for new thoughts and perceptions. As some of you might already know, breakthroughs in understanding and breakthroughs in knowledge occur at the edge at the boundary of knowing and not knowing, which is a rather nimble state of mind. And it's a state of mind that one cannot be in for any length, any period of time. But it is nonetheless a magical state of mind, uh, which if you're able to, 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 to cultivate in yourself through patience and through understanding and through a great deal of compassion for the other, you can really uh, become a good leader. And it allows one to engage in a non-defensive way with change. So we are constantly surrounded by change. And what could be more perplexing than the change, the global change that we are currently being thrust into in this recent pandemic, where uh, we just don't know from one minute to the next what's happening. Uh, and this is all being thrust upon us in a way that will forever change the way we look at life and the way we relate to one another, the way we greet one another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I thought that this could be—it's a very germane thing um, to negative capability because all of us are right now, at least we are in the U.S., um, uh, totally under lockdown, and uh, I haven't stepped out of my home other than just to go to the grocery store or to the pharmacy for almost about six weeks now. And uh, a lot of us are getting cabin fever. A lot of us don't know what life holds for us. Uh, and we're, we're scared. Uh, we have, some of us are paranoid. Some of us are really scared and anxious. I'm certainly in my uh, late 60s, so you can well imagine uh, that uh, my level of anxiety is probably higher than somebody who is in his or her 20s and 30s. So let me go to the next slide. Negative versus positive capability. It's a dialectical tension. So when you look at negative capability as an expression, think of it as an oxymoron, all right? The word negative and capability cancel each other out. You don't think of capability as anything but positive, how much we know, how much we can get done, and how quickly we can arrive at decisions. Negative, the, the word negative in the expression negative capability has a different connotation. By negative, we mean how much we don't know. It starts with an empty space while resisting the urge to disperse into action when the anxiety and uncertainty are high. It's a state of being comfortable with not knowing and not doing. So once again, negative capability uh, is an expression that calls upon us as humans to be in a capacity or in a frame of mind where we are comfortable, uh, not forever, but for a period of time, comfortable with not knowing and not doing. And why would we do that? We want to create a space, we call this the negative space, in which we can remain for a period of time. It's an ephemeral state, it's a fleeting state of mind, uh, in which we are patient, uh, and it's, which we are compassionate, and we are allowing the fears, the anxieties, the feelings, and the emotions of the other person or persons to enter that space so we can together hold that space, all right? Some of you that are psychotherapists or counselors or those that work with conflict resolution, conflict mediation, 
know that it is extremely important uh, uh, to, to hold that space, all right? And especially psychotherapists, uh, uh, they probably encounter this uh, state of mind um, with their clients and, and patients every single day. So negative capability and creativity in the post-industrial society. So, we're, so if you fast forward 200 years, you know, he, John Keats um, uh, coined the expression in 1815, uh, as I said in a letter to his brothers when he was, he was referring to William Shakespeare. Uh, but now 200 years later, what's happening? How can we apply negative capability to our everyday life? So I took the concept of negative capability uh, and I was nursing it in my mind. I was playing around with it mind even before I ever entered a doctoral program. It was fascinating to me to see how a young poet in his 20s could come up with something so brilliant, all right, and so novel. And, uh, and I was really intrigued and wanted to to explore this, wanted to research this uh, in my doctoral program. And I found that there was no studies whatsoever that had been done on negative capability from a leadership standpoint and from the standpoint other than a, in aesthetics and poetry. There are, of course, references and, and journal articles and things of that nature in aesthetics, in poetry but none that I could see in my field of study, which is organizational development and leadership. Rousseau, 2014, uh, and Rousseau is, a, is an author that had written a beautiful journal article in which he's looking at paradoxes where we are conflicted between two different, different things. Um, uh, and he feels that a paradox, this knowing and not knowing is essential to creativity. And uh, of course, there's a reference to Rousseau's uh, journal article at the end of the, uh, the presentation, you'll see a list of references. But what he's talking about is a dialectical tension between freedom and constraint in the creative process. So, you know, we were always um, uh, taught and uh, I certainly have always uh, believed, uh, rightfully or wrongfully so, that uh, creativity occurs when you leave people totally free to do what they want to do, to be what they want to be. Um, and, and while that is true, that is not totally and entirely true because uh, what tends to happen is uh, with a little bit of constraint, and especially when we're looking at uh, geographic teams that are virtual, uh, a little bit of constraint in teamwork a little bit of uh, structure in the dream work and little, some restraints that are put on that. It could be the restraints that are put on us while we have deadlines or um, timelines in which a project has to be completed. Those are important for creativity to come forth. So it's not that, hey, we leave all the, the entire team to be free and, and just go out there and play and do your thing and there's gonna be a lot of creativity. So he has an interesting paper out there that I would highly recommend that you read. Teams may greatly benefit from constraints. So he uh, pointed out in his, um, in his uh, paper that when you introduce some constraints, teams actually do benefit from that and their creativity is enhanced. So I look at negative capability as a form of constraint, is it not? So once again, negative capability is the capacity to be in mysteries, doubts, and uncertainty without an irritable reaching up to fact and reason. As you can see, I, I, earlier in this presentation, I said that there are two stems, two parts of that question. The first part being, being in this capacity to stay with mysteries, doubts, and uncertainty. And the remainder of that, the other segment is, without the irritable reaching up to fact and reason. So what are we really saying? To be in that nimble state of mind, to the ephemeral state of mind, without succumbing to the pressure of polarization to take sides, without succumbing to the pressure to do something about it, without succumbing to the pressure of dispersal 
to get out of that, to exit that frame of mind. All right. So, uh, and I and I stand corrected. I said he uh, coined the expression in 1815. Um, I stand corrected. It was 1817 that this young poet, John Keats, a famous English romantic poet in England, uh, coined the expression. So let's just go to the next slide. Now, I just wanted to give you the backdrop of that that phenomena that I was researching. So I was trying to research negative capability and expression that is attributed to John Keats. So my research question for my dissertation was, what is it like for leaders to be in a state of negative capability during periods of uncertainty and conflict in the workplace? Now, as you will see, it's an ontological question. It's a phenomenological question phenomenological research question, because I'm asking the question, what is it like for leaders to be in a state of negativity? How do leaders make sense of something? What meaning structures do they, do they think of? What meaning structures do they attribute in their minds when they're thrust into periods of uncertainty and conflict in the workplace? So you'll see, I have a context there, which is the workplace. Um, I am uh, specifically talking about the context of workplace that is undergoing periods of change, uncertainty, and conflict. Uh, and I'm also um, front and center uh, talking about negative capability. And, and if you notice from my research question, I also know who my participants are going to be. So I'm talking about researching leaders. Okay, uh, and researching the state of mind of negative capability. So let me just progress to the next slide. My literature review. So when I looked at uh, negative capability, I found uh, that the extant literature only was covering aesthetics, poetry, which is rightfully so, understandably so. John Keats was an English poet. Uh, so clearly there was uh, references, uh, journal articles, a few books written on negative capability, uh, Walter Bateson and everybody else that have written the books, uh, but it was all around poetry, it was all around aesthetics. There was really nothing that I could find uh, going in um, which directly spoke to uh, negative capability as a phenomena. Other than, of course, I got from literature and poetry, but I am a student of leadership or organizational development, so, uh, and organizational thinking, so how do I, I cannot just have a literature review that is solely based on aesthetics and, and poetry, right? So what happens then? So as I started to look at that, uh, I was perplexed, and I reached out to my uh, dissertation advisor, and I said, Bob, uh, there's no other literature that's available. What am I going to do? So as a novice researcher, as a new researcher, I was under the impression that I should have the exact same literature. So if I'm doing dialectical tension, it should only be about dialectical tension. If I'm researching um, employee engagement, it should literature should only be about employee engagement. Yes, that is true. But what if you're not able to find enough literature? Do you just stop the study? Do you stop your dissertation? No. Well, you have to look for, he said, conversations that are happening around negative capability in other fields by other authors, by other thinkers. Now, what if they're not using the same expression negative capability in their articles or in their, in their thinking in journals? Well, he said, in that case, you would have to deconstruct, you'd have to unpack negative capability and think of it in, the, in some form that you feel you can get and, and see and review literature on. So what, that was a little bit of a, 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 a tension for me. What am I gonna do when I'm gonna find this? So as I looked, at the expression negative capability, I started to think increasingly 
that there was a dialectical tension there between knowing and not knowing, doing and not doing, between the capacity to hold something and be in the mysteries, doubts, and uncertainty without the irritable reaching out to factor reason. So there was a dialectical tension. There was this, this uh, tug between doing something and not doing something. And I said, wow, dialectical. Let me go look for dialectical tension. Let me look for dialectics. And lo and behold, I found plenty of literature out there uh, in organizational psychodynamics, Wilfred Beyond and Robert French. They've written a lot about th this kind of tension uh, and, and others. But uh, Robert French uh, and Wilfred Beyond had made references to this negative capability frame of mind. So organizations like dynamics was one of them. Uh, my literature in the literature I certainly got from poetry, Keats, Bay, um, dialogism, and dialectics. When you're looking at dialectical tension, you're looking at this uh, tension of opposites sometimes. Okay, uh, Bakhtin, a Russian philosopher, Baxter and Montgomery, their work on relational dialectics is phenomenal. Uh, and you know what? I looked at Buddhism and uncertainty, the work of Bachelor and Epstein. I was amazed because Buddhism talks about mindful awareness. Buddhism talks about koans. Uh, Buddhism talks about the eternal truths where you remain yourself or you trust yourself in not knowing and doubts and uncertainty. I found that amazing and interesting. So I certainly was able to write in my literature review on Buddhism and in uncertainty, both from the standpoint of uh, Zen Buddhism and classical Tibetan Buddhism, though my, my work was more centered on the Zen Buddhism aspect uh, for my literature review. Then I also looked at levels of abstraction, a posthumous study that was done by Sandra Elson, on different levels of abstraction, how you stay at a certain vantage point. And if you remain in that vantage point uh, and keep looking at a phenomena from that vantage point, you just see a limited view of the phenomena. So sometimes to look at the entire battlefield, a general has to step up and go to a different level of abstraction. Uh, you know, as you know, intimacy and abstraction are dialectical expressions, but more on that later. I also looked at entanglements and transmedial thinking of Chow and communicative space. So all of these, the while they did not, with the exception of poetry, talk about negative capability per se, they were all talking about this dialectics, this dialectical tension between knowing and not knowing, between doing and not doing uh, as a frame of mind between holding this space and not holding the space, between staying with the agony of uncertainty, sometimes, believe it or not, it feels like agony, to be in that frame of mind of not knowing and not doing, um, and, 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 and yet hold that tension for a period of time and waiting and patiently for something new to emerge. It does not always emerge, but more often than not, uh, some breakthroughs in understanding can happen. So let's go to the next slide. My research methodology was interpretative phenomenological analysis. So now I'm not going to go into the nuts and bolts of IPA because I have another presentation uh, uh, on, in my YouTube channel, which is the use of IPA in qualitative data analysis which I would highly recommend you go and take a look at. It's a long presentation in which I've deconstructed and unpacked the entire IPA process, including how to collect data, what to collect, how to break it down into stages of analysis, etc. I think you'll find it very helpful. So this, I'm just giving you a general overview of interpretive phenomenological analysis. So it is a psychological approach to qualitative research developed in the mid nineties by Smith, 2019, and colleagues at the Birkbeck University of London. IPA rests on three foundations. So think of it as on three pillars, phenomenology, 
hermeneutics and ideography phenomenology you all know is the understanding the or exploring the essence of phenomena hermeneutics is about interpretation it's about sense making so specifically in this kind of phenomenology as it contrasted with descriptive phenomenology of uh, or transcendental phenomenology of Husserl uh, and, and and more contemporary uh, psychologists such as uh, Emilio Gorgi, uh, hermeneutic phenomenology is about interpretation. So while IPA is a hermeneutic uh, phenomenology, it also incorporates ideography. Ideography means very specifically you're talking about people's cases, narratives on their own terms, in their own words. So there's a familiarity with the person that you're interviewing uh, and you're allowing them to share their personal experiences with you. It does not attempt to prove, disprove, validate, or refute hypotheses or theories. This is an important thing to understand in phenomenology and not going out there to prove something to disprove something, to hypothesize, as you would in quantitative studies. IPA and phenomenology are about allowing a phenomena to reveal itself to you in its most primordial and originary forms. You are allowing something to show itself to you, to give itself to you, it's a difficult concept to get around because on the one hand, researcher is consciously making this effort to do something as though the phenomena is at the beck and call of the researcher. But really in phenomenology, the phenomena is not at your beck and call. Even though the phenomena is right there in front of your eyes, sometimes it is obscured. The phenomena is not hidden. It is not lying there somewhere. 10 miles away, it is right in front of your face, but you're not able to see it because it's not showing itself to you. And why is it not showing itself to you? Because it's covered by all these layers of misconceptions, understanding your theoretical framework, your interpretative paradigm. So you will have to allow yourself to bracket all of that. And I'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. IP, how is it different from other phenomenological methods? So one, uh, I particularly liked IPA right from the start because it's a turnkey step-by-step -step approach to qualitative data collection and analysis when the emphasis is on novelty and creativity. Now you form, uh, or actually find other forms of phenomenological studies using different approaches, different techniques, uh, descriptive is one of them, uh, as I was just mentioning. But uh, given that phenomenology is a very convoluted approach, okay, there's a lot of dots that, that need to be connected. And, and sometimes new researchers, or I was, as a matter of fact, most of the new researchers get perplexed. They want a, was something to wrap their head around is some sort of structure, some sort of an approach, somewhere where they can hang their hat, um, as opposed to just floundering out there, all right, as though you're hanging from the trees, not knowing where you're going. You really have to have some sort of a structure. So unlike what people think that uh, qualitative research is, oh my God, it's all about this mumbo jumbo about abstract concepts, thoughts, feelings, et cetera, et cetera. While that is true, uh, what is also true is that there is a certain way of going about the research, all right? It's not a free for everyone, all right? So it's a, it, there's, a, there's a methodology there, there's a technique there, it's scientific to a point, um, but not in the form that the researcher has a hands-off relationship with the phenomena or with the participant. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. There are three things you should know. There's an interviewer, i.e. yourself. <clears throat> There's a participant, the people that you're gonna have as part of the study. Uh, these are folks that um, are able to talk with some authority about your phenomena. That's why you recruited them into a purpose of sample. And you co-create data for analysis. The A is a co-creation of data. So unlike in, 
quantitative studies where a researcher might send 100 or 200 to 500 questionnaires and uh, people are passively um, uh, filling out those questionnaires and sending them back and then the researcher is looking at the data and analyzing and sifting through the data this is not what you're doing in phenomenology and certainly not in qualitative research you are a co-creator of knowledge you're a co-creator of data all right so ip has an ideographic focus which means how an indiv individual in a given context, it's very important to have that context. You can't just say, uh, what does employee engagement mean to you? Okay, now that can be researched phenomenology, but that's more about descriptive phenomenology. When you're looking at the idos or the essential structures of employee engagement or the whatness of something, but when you're looking at IPA, you're looking at the work of Heidegger in addition to Husserl, because Heidegger is talking about the ontological meaning. What is it like for someone to make sense of a phenomena in a given context, making sense of in a given meaning? There's a double hermeneutic. You'll hear that expression in IPA. The researcher, that is yourself, is making sense of the participant, the person that you're interviewing, who is making sense of phenomena. So when you ask a participant, can you talk about some experiences of having, you know, being in a negative capability frame of mind or being in a situation where you were really perplexed at work uh, because of the changes that were happening or whatever the case may be, you're asking them to reflect on something, right? So the phenomena is out there. The participant is looking at that phenomena and looking at the phenomena through their own lens. And you are looking at what the participant is looking at, right? So let me, let me say that again. So you are making sense. You're making meaning out of what the participant is making meaning of as it relates to the phenomena. So there's a double hermeneutic, double interpretation, double dual lens through which you're looking at this phenomena. And when you introduce the reader, someday you finish your dissertation and the reader is looking at your study, all right, uh, there's a triple hermeneutic because the reader is making sense of you, the researcher, who is making sense of the participant, who is making sense of the phenomena. These are the triple lenses, the three lenses there. So it's very, it's layered, it's multi-layered, it's multi-complex. Um, form of interpretation. It's not just looking at something and saying, hey, I see this is something, it's, um, it's an ear pod, or this is an iPhone, or this is a pen, all right? You're looking at it from your own standpoint, but when you look at it through diff three different lenses, it, it calls for a different level of complexity. IPA is different from other methods because of its combination of psychological, interpretative, and ideographic components. Why psychological? Because, you know, as you can well imagine, these were health psychologists, Jonathan Smith, Larkins and Flowers in UK at the University of Birkbeck, who formulated this and who, who actually they were, they were a little tired of the traditional cognitive psychology, which is so laboratory based um, and where there was no room for understanding the thoughts, feelings and perceptions uh, or, or emotions of something. Or, or somebody. So they were intrigued by this and they developed this uh, and they were all health psychologists. So they wanted to understand what do patients experience when they're going through lower back pain? What do patients experience when they're going through dialysis, right? What does an unwed mother think? How does she feel? What, how does she make sense of being a single parent? You know, things of that nature. So it's very complex and there were be be careful if you're if you're going to be using IPA I would highly recommend that you have on your committee or on your um, uh, on your faculty uh, team someone that is steeped in phenomenology not someone who has studied phenomenology and received a certificate of attendance but I would really say someone who has actually done his or her own 
dissertation, doctoral dissertation on phenomenology using IPA as an approach. IPA is a very distinct approach. Okay, so enough said about that. IPA continued, it's the emphasis on researcher reflexivity. You'll hear the expression researcher reflexivity a lot. It's a self-referential focus. What do we mean by that? Uh, you're not looking at everything on the outside, i.e. that is what is happening to the participant, what's the participant saying, what is the participant meaning, how do I make sense of the participant. You're also looking at what's happening to you as the researcher. What are you going through? What, what formulations are happening in your mind? What, what are you struggling with as it relates to this tension between knowing and not knowing? The researcher is obligated to explicitly narrate the impact of the self on the study. Very, very critical. A lot of times you'll find people saying, hey, why is your phenomenological research study using an active voice? Why is it, for the most part, in the first person? Well, guess what, folks? Phenomenologies are written in the first person. And I'm not suggesting that the entire study is written in the first person because you are gonna have your literature review where you're making references to others' work. That's written in the third person. Uh, your research design methodology and methods chapter will be oftentimes also written in the third person, but your introduction chapter, your analysis chapter, your data collection chapter, uh, and finally your your chapter around um, you know the the uh, the outcomes or not the outcomes the findings discussion future implications the final capstone chapter is written also in the first person the next is the inductive interpretation the hermeneutics hermeneutics of description and hermeneutics of suspicion so you are doing your interpretation, you're making sense of the phenomena at two different levels. There's a level of description. What is grabbing you? What is the, how do you describe something that's occurring right before your eyes? Something that you can make sense of the, the ADOS or the essential attributes of something. But there's also lurking below the hermeneutics of suspicion. And not as in you're suspecting something, but you're remaining those mysteries. You're trying to figure out, is this something that I'm missing? What am I not seeing? Or what am I seeing too much of? And what am I bringing into my interpretation that I need to set aside, that I need to bracket? We call it the epochy. Uh, there's a descriptive, linguistic, and conceptual level of analysis in IPA. So IPA is about smaller corpuses, it's about six or seven participants at the most. You can, of course, do 10, 12, 14. I did for my doctoral research dissertation 14 because my uh, faculty members wanted me to do at least 15. I actually lined up 15 interviews, but one of the participants dropped out of the, uh, to, out of the whole study. So I ended up with 14. But IPA typically uh, warrants, or not warrants, they, they, they uh, they suggest that you do smaller corpuses of five or six uh, participants at the most. Why? Because you're not going wide, you're going deep. You're going into the descriptive, linguistic, and conceptual levels of analysis. And each of these levels has to be properly written about, okay, narrated. Uh, I, I, for those of you that are not familiar with this, but about 60 to 70% of your entire doctoral study is in the writing. Analysis is important, data collection is important, recruiting participants is important, researching the study design is all of that stuff. The pilot is important, but really the most important thing where it really comes to life uh, with a lot of pathos, with a lot of tender emotions, feelings, is your um, writing work. It recognizes the importance of bracketing assumptions. I think I was talking about bracketing earlier uh, while collecting data, but allowing the researchers paradigmatic frameworks and assumptions to enter the analysis. So, so it, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge there. You have to be in that nimble frame of mind. So on the one hand, you know that you're bracketing, setting aside your own 
ideas, assumptions, uh, interpretations about the phenomena so that you can get to the essence of the phenomena. On the other hand, you know that it's not humanly possible for you to totally divest from that, totally keep that aside in brackets or parenthesize that. So uh, you allow that to come in, and but you're making a conscious effort so that it does not impinge on your research. Later in the study, you will be using, especially in the final chapter, uh, you will be talking about what kind of assumption that you make and whether those assumptions were correct, incorrect, uh, and what was happening to you while you were doing the study. And that's the basics of reflexivity, okay? Being reflexive, uh, self-referential. It follows the hermeneutic circle part in relation to the whole. So when you're doing the analysis, you're transcribing the data, uh, the interviews you're looking at, every interview on its own terms, in its own way, in its own content. And, but you're also looking at the whole. So it's a part to the whole, whole to the part. It's called the hermeneutic circle. Selection criteria, pilot and study group. So why I'm talking about my pilot and study group. I participated uh, people, leaders from academia, private practice and business organizations. So it is a form of triangulation. All right, I've needed to hear from three different kinds of leaders, uh, academia, private practice, and business organizations. Age range for me was 35 to 65, employed or self-employed, and have at least five years of experience, familiar with the notion of negative capability, determined through phone conversation. So how do you determine if someone is familiar with you? Now, would you just recruit someone that doesn't know anything about your phenomena? No, absolutely not. What good would that do you study? You want to recruit people that have intimate familiarity with your phenomena because what you're trying to get at is their accounts, their verbatim accounts of how they make sense of something. And if they haven't ever experienced it, can they tell you with authority how, how they make sense of it? No. So please be careful when you recruit a purposive sample that you specifically inquire with participants if they have intimate knowledge about your phenomena. They should have experienced significant anxiety around one at least situation. Uh, as you know, my uh, research phenomena or research questions rather was uh, what is it like for leaders to be in a state of negative capability in periods of conflict in the workplace? So necessarily, uh, because I threw it in the, that in the context, I wanted to have uh, leaders who had significant anxiety around at least one situation at work where they found themselves to be in a state of uncertainty. Okay, again, determined through phone conversations. Comfortable sharing their experiences with the research in a one on setting. So you want to have participants who are comfortable talking about this. And it may be sometimes very intimate stuff very personal stuff that you're trying to get to get them to talk about and they may not be totally comfortable so you have to create a safety there um, through your informed consent forms through the ethics considerations make sure that they know that whatever they might say to you will remain confidential uh, and will not be disclosed to anyone uh, also their actual names will not be used you'll be using pseudonyms for the study so that uh, you are not uh, disclosing uh, their context or their names or who they are because you don't want to jeopardize someone, all right? Someone's career or whatever, because they may be talking about some very intimate uh, and confidential stuff. They agreed to sign the informed consent form. Now in the US, the informed consent form is a very, very important form and also, in other parts of the world, uh, some form of ethics forms are required. It's, uh, it's not just a casual requirement here, it's a very formal requirement here in the US. Uh, and we have to be cleared by the Institutional Review Board, which is the IRB, before we can start to have these conversations, before we can start to interview these human subjects. Uh, the, of course, as you know, the informed consent form and all of this is uh, to protect the 
interests of human subjects so that they are not psychologically damaged uh, or affected in some way, shape or form. Our idea, first of all, our mission is to not do anyone any harm. And on that note also, sometimes people will want to drop out of the study because they don't feel comfortable. Um, you, can, you don't have to enforce them to stay. If they want to drop out, let them know that they're free to drop out. Any, and this will be part of your informed consent form also. So enough on that. Um, the study, my study design was I had to do a pilot study. So I did a pilot study with uh, three leaders before I did the main interviews. The, the, the reason for the pilot study is, so you have some semi-structured interviews conducted uh, that you can look at, and it's kind of like a, like a prototype. You can look at before you actually dive into the main dissertation. Uh, and that gives you a, an idea uh, of some, um, what changes, if any, uh, might need to be made, uh, any course corrections that are required, uh, are there any, unintended um, issues that are cropping up, and especially with technology, et cetera. I was doing all my interviews with uh, leaders through the GoToMeeting web-based platform at the time. Uh, now I use Zoom very effectively, but at that time I was using GoToMeeting. And you wanna make sure that there are no glitches, uh, that everything works fine, everything, all the recordings are crisp, because you need to have a clear, clear and very crisp recording because uh, that's important to your transcription efforts. Uh, you also are required to make some notes as you're doing these interviews, all right? Uh, my study design was the actual design based on the results of the pilot. Semi-structured interviews were conducted with 15, one dropped out, as I said, of the study, her data were not included. Interviews transcribed by the researcher, i.e. myself, using the Inkscribe software, Data analysis was conducted manually. Now, now some, some of you have asked me, uh, is it better to collect data manually or uh, through technology, using software? Uh, there's no one right or wrong answer. It's what you feel comfortable with. I am very um, anxious, or not, not anxious, I'm very uh, concerned about confidentiality issues. So, uh, you know, <coughs> A, I don't uh, ever, uh, outsource my data to somebody to, for transcription, all right? But um, I, the, one of the reasons why I collect data manually, um, and again, others may do it differently, I need to have a look at what it is that I'm doing. So am, am, am I missing something? Um, and when I go manually, I, when I do the iterations, the, the repeated readings, I always pick up something new. All right, and it gives me a sense of the familiarity because I am the one that actually transcribed the data, also, or transcribed the manuscripts. So uh, again, it's your choice whether when you want to do technology, you can use Atlas, you can do NVivo. There are a number of different um, software uh, uh, programs that are available to do that. It wouldn't um, hurt if you use it, used NVivo to sort of do the, so it helps you do the coding, it helps you uh, look for divergences and convergences, et cetera, if your data set is very large. But in IPA, usually uh, the data set is not that voluminous. So I would not um, recommend doing um, it uh, solely on the basis of technology. So now you might, one might wanna do a mix. Uh, you can use the help of software, but also look at data manually. I want you to eyeball the data, okay? Uh, and I, you, you, when you do it, you'll t tell me that it was helpful to do that, okay? Now, five-step approach to data analysis and interpretation. Your first step is the individual case narrative. So now you've done the 14 interviews, uh, you've transcribed the data. You have to write about individually all the 14 interviews. And in those interviews, all you're doing is you are taking verbatim, you're writing a little summary about every interview, of course, all pseudonyms. And then you would um, ask your question, your question is uh, stated in that narrative, individual narrative, and you take verbatim extracts from the actual interviews to support your, um, your work, okay? 
It's very important to do that. Uh, and it also gives the reader a, an impression, an insight into how you went about researching. Whether it's all stuff that you made up yourself or is there a specific uh, method that you took and, and, and went about. Then you list all the themes that emerged from the individual cases. All right. And I'm not going to go through the, uh, the entire six stage process, which you can look at my other channel uh, on my channel. There's, uh, as I said, there's another uh, presentation where I've really gone into a thorough uh, data analysis, data uh, uh, collection steps for IPA. It's called use of IPA in qualitative data analysis. Please take a look at that. If you don't know where to find it, uh, reach out to me at the end of this presentation and I will uh, point you to that link. Um, the clustering of themes. You really, so once you list the themes that emerge, you cluster the themes to make them, and this is a process of distillation. You're making it smaller. It's a process of phenomenological reduction uh, through bracketing and then to further reducing this into, because what you're doing is you think of it like a hopper, like a big funnel in which you're putting a lot of data in. And what's being going through that funnel is stuff that has been distilled that you want to look at very closely. Then you create a master listing of group level superordinate themes. Okay, right? So you, you have these superordinate themes, you have the subordinate themes and the superordinate themes. Both of them are germane to your phenomena. Remember one thing when you first get the themes, many of those themes or not many, but at least some of those themes may not have a direct relationship with your phenomena, but they are emerging nonetheless. So you will have to use your keen eye, your artistic eye, your eye to discern and make sure that the themes that you're bringing in the cl and clustering are themes that directly relate to the phenomena. So let's say you're, you're talking about employee engagement and somebody starts talking about cricket. All right a cricket match and there are three or four people uh, you know you're talking about uh, someone from a commonwealth country um, uh, india let's say right and and they're looking at uh, a cricket match was just just happened and they all start to talk about cricket so does cricket have anything to do with employee engagement probably not so you may have to separate those those emerging themes and say okay they appeared uh, we set them aside. These are not for the purpose of analysis. Then you create a master listing of group level subordinate teams, the superordinate teams. These are teams that rise to the top. So let's say you started with uh, the, the total corpus, say 70 emergent teams that appeared from all 14 interviews. From the 70, when you cluster them, you may come down to about 35. All right. And when you further look at them, you may actually come up to maybe one third, 10, maybe 15 superordinate teams. But even in these superordinate teams, you have to figure out, are all of these teams critically important? Which are the ones most important? So how do you determine from 15 teams, the ones that are less important and the ones that are more important? And all of them appear important. So you really, it's a simple process of Frequency, how frequently did those themes emerge in your data? So the themes that emerged most frequently in your data uh, are the ones that rise to the top. They are the ones that are prioritized. And when you write a group narrative, combined group narrative, it's not a group analysis, but it's a group narrative in which you're talking about people. And now this is where you bring in citations, references, other data from your literature review chapter. Remember you did a literature review chapter like I did? Uh, you need bring in all those citations. So you're supporting, and here's where you start to in, make your interpretations using your paradigms, your theoretical frameworks, et cetera, et cetera, and supporting them with literature. In the individual case narratives, which is number one, uh, which is right there, and I'm bringing my cursor right there, in this, you are not using your interpretative paradigm. You're simply 
And whatever little sense you're making is you're only making sense out of what they're telling you from the verbatim extracts. Be very, very careful about that. While in the master listing in the group level narrative, which is right here, you are using citations and references from, so here there are no citations from literature review. Here there are citations from literature review and references because here you're unpacking and for the reader, what happened to all this entire process of 14 or 15 interviews, you're down to like you now 15 themes. And from the 15 themes, you arrived at three themes. What are the findings? What are you really discovering from this? Okay, so let's go to the final. The individual case narrative and emergence of themes. Now, these are some, uh, I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but I'll read just one slide. The sense of self and identity was one of the themes, right? So this, uh, one of my interviewees or uh, participants said, the bigger challenge is how to be an American leader in an Indonesian run American company. My identity as a leader, everyone reminds me that I'm an expat. My context is Indonesian. So my dilemma is what part of me still applies to this context. So she is in a struggle. She's in that conflict, uh, being an American lady uh, who's working in an Indonesian company in a foreign land, was clearly, uh, while they, they welcome uh, Americans, they're also thinking about their own identity. And she's thinking about her own identity as a, as a Jewish person, okay? It's interesting, there's a terminology today called workplace bullying. So I'm bringing in another one from another participant. I did not fully understand the definition back then. It was not a subject that was openly discussed. It was my survival instinct. Look at the survival instinct here. You either stay knowing that it will strip you of your confidence, compromise your values, so it becomes a mode of self-survival. See that survival instinct, self-survival, survival of self, okay? Because it is interesting to read about people who live through horrific abuse from someone close to them, and you wonder how they ever came out from the other side. So this is just, these are, these are verbatim extracts from those interviews that while I was doing the case narratives, individual case narratives, I would put these extracts there, all right? And the second is about intermingling of personal and professional life. I'm not gonna go through all this. Uh, you're certainly welcome if all, anybody wants a, a copy of my entire presentation, please feel free to email me. I will be uh, noting my email address at the final, um, on the final slide, so you can certainly reach out to me. But uh, read this, uh, you know, and, and this is important because it gives you that this is what is so both easy and complex because you're, you're taking verbatim extract, but how do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of how they're making sense of something? That something is out there, it's the phenomena, remember? So how, how do you make sense of, from their words, okay? Okay, let's take a look at the five superordinate teams. These are the group level challenges, all right? So I had all these superordinate teams that came out. Exercising servant leadership, intermingling of personal and professional life, discomfort in managing and holding polarities and paradox, difficulty with making sense of identity, challenges with corporate politics, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, I've listed them in terms of the order in which they had received, they, the order in which they had appeared, they had emerged, the frequency with which they had emerged in the, in the entire corpus. Um, so my findings were uh, in the group analysis, because, <coughs> excuse me, in the group analysis, you're doing some sort of a group level um, narrative. Majority of leaders interviewed appeared to have a diminished capacity to contain uncertainty when faced with paradoxical dilemmas. In these situations, they resort to behaviors such as problem solving, consulting others, shutting down, and dispersing as a means of defending against it. So this is a major finding. So you've got to have a finding from your group analysis if you're going to be looking at all this data and you're taking uh, citations from your literature review, you're making reference to other conversation, other authors, others thinking, you gotta have some sort of finding. Now remember, this finding is not the, a definitive determination. It is not an outcome. 
He said, these are just findings. This is what you found. And how did you find it from the data, from the interviews? Important. And if you have a schematic diagram such as this, it helps the viewer. So look at this, holding polarities and paradox and how it's conflicted between problem solving. So when this person is thrust into holding polarities and paradox, either there's problem solving, there's consulting others, shutting down or dispersing. Dispersing means running away from that or changing the topic or changing the whole context of that, all right? So let's go to the next slide. Other findings and strongly emerging themes. The context, these, are, these were some other findings. So that was a major finding. These are some other findings. The context in which a leader is embedded does not have a significant bearing on the way that individual experiences negativity. So I had made an assumption in my study that perhaps as I interview these leaders, these leaders will have some differences in the way they look at negative capability depending on the context depending upon uh, what kind of type of workplace remember i told you there was a triangulation business organizations academia and private practice leaders uh, i wanted to see if those working in those different contexts they would have a difference in the way they saw negative capability and you know what? Lo and behold, I found that it had no bearing whatsoever on the way they experienced negative capability. They were all going with the same or almost the same process of managing the uncertainty, managing the anxiety. There was a deviant finding. Now, you know, there was a uh, bit of a, um, not a conflict, but uh, sort of like uh, a back and forth with my uh, dissertation chair. Uh, he said, what is the point of, uh, pointing out this deviant finding. The deviant findings are findings that absolutely have nothing to do with your phenomena, and yet they have everything to do with your phenomena. So as you know, my phenomena was negative capability. And in my very first interview, I came across a participant who described very eloquently how two of her grown-up sons were suffering from acute OCD. Right, it's so debilitating and so terribly overwhelming for her that she so she didn't know how to handle it. So the way she wanted to handle it was uh, remain in that state of mind without iteratively reaching up to something. Uh, and 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 she had attended a lot of. Uh, seminar workshops at OCD. So she had a lot to say about OCD. And as we were talking, she mentioned to me, she said, you know what? Negative capability has a very close correlation with OCD. If only I could teach my sons, or if only therapists could coach and teach and help OCD patients to stay in that perplexed state of mind between knowing and not knowing, wouldn't that be nice if you could break that cycle of rituals, which is what both perpetuates the anxiety and alleviates the anxiety, uh, wouldn't that be great? So I went back to my, um, to my dissertation chair and I said, I'd like to introduce this finding. And he said, well, it's got nothing to do with your leadership. It's got nothing to do with this. It's more of a therapeutic type uh, psychologist, psychotherapist, I should know, because Jonathan Smith, Flowers, and Larkin specifically talk about deviant findings. If you find something that is an out, total outlier, you really have to bring it in, not make it part of the data set, but to give it special treatment in your, and maybe you can take it in the finding, uh, findings chapter or the last chapter. I, I, and I've discussed this in my, in my chapter, uh, chapter five, which is discussion uh, outcome, uh, no, no, discussion, future implications. I even remember, forget the title of my final chapter, but that's the final chapter. So I have the a section on OCD and, and that and how it ties in with that. And, I, and, and not just saying that there's a link there, but actually sharing how in my first interview, I had this lady who talked about this. So you have to use those, those references to be able to explain that. Exercising servant leadership and mingling, intermingling of leaders' personal and professional lives are strongly emerging themes. So there were the true themes, the servant leadership and intermingling of leaders' personal and professional lives 
Now, here's, here's the thing. Servant leadership, we all understand. They were all leaders, so servant leadership. They all strive to be servant leaders, strive to serve uh, the ones that they, uh, they are helping okay, in, the, in their organizations. But intermingling of leaders' personal and professional lives was very intriguing to me. Why? Because I was asking them specifically questions around workplace, around the workplace. I was not saying what's happening in your personal life, what is your relationship with your wife, relationship with your kids, relationship with your friends. And yet, they kept going back to their personal lives. This was very interesting to me. Why should that happen? Now, then I started to, and you'll read in my dissertation if you get a chance to read it. But by the way, my dissertation is also in the form of a book, all right? Uh, on Amazon. So you can read um, the book. It has the same title, Negative Capability, a phenomenological study of lived experience at the edge of certitude and incertitude. So it's a book published on Amazon um, and in which I've talked at more length about this. So let me just move to the next slide. Uh, discussion. So here in the discussion, this is the final chapter, folks. Uh, leaders in highly uncertain and perplexing situations become instruments of action rather than instruments of thoughtful reflection. Now, what does that mean? So I had assumed, again, in the context of negative capability, that perhaps when leaders are conflicted in that state of mind, when they're looking at negative capability, looking at this quandary between knowing and not knowing, that they would be in a state of thoughtful reflection. Now, while some of them were, but most of them sprung out to take action. They became instruments of action rather than instruments of thoughtful reflection. So they jumped in to fix something, to fix the anxiety, to disperse it, to get rid of it, so that they can all return to normal. All right. Research scholars, especially those that are engaged in qualitative studies, may find that the practice of negative capability provides a means of holding their anxieties and tensions in what can be a very messy process that is replete with uncertainty. I felt that negative capability could be a great competency for those involved in qualitative studies, because in qualitative studies, you oftentimes do not know what it is that you're going to find. You set up to do research, you set up a research question, you have all noble thoughts about where you're going to be going, you're mounting a stallion, and you don't know where you're going to end up. So you're in a state, you've thrust in this stage of perplexity and uncertainty. Uh, and what can be better than having the capacity to exercise negative capability? So in my presentations after my dissertation was done, in all my workshops that I've done, about 25 different qualitative research workshops, uh, uh, mostly in India, uh, because that's where I was invited uh, initially to do the workshops and one thing led to another. And at, at all the premier institutes in India, I've already done workshops. So, which has been a very, very edifying experience. I've met some wonderful uh, and very, very bright uh, doctoral scholars there. So, so now I'm looking at uh, doing some workshops at the University of York, uh, and also a university in Jamaica. Uh, so we will see how that goes. But the practice of negative capability presents a strange paradox. As we attempt to hold to contrasting and conflicting attitudes together, resulting in a state of tension. There's a state of tension. What makes the predicament even harder is that the two polarities positions may not necessarily present us with an easy choice. It's not an either, either or. So you either do this or you do that. They're very often complementary and independent or interdependent, not mutually exclusive. So they're, not, they're not incompatible. They have to be held together in a dialectical tension. Future research and application, the development of negative capability 360. So I use negative capability to create a 360 feedback instrument um, early on in my career um, through a, a company called Leader Nation in New York. Uh, I also find deployment of negative capability with teams striving for creativity and innovation to be an extremely valuable um, application. Uh, partnering with mental health professionals to develop negative capability. This has been my wish. I'm not a, I'm not a psychotherapist 
or a psychologist per se. Um, and I would hope that uh, somebody uh, or team of psychologists would use this tool to create a cognitive behavioral CBT therapy tool to alleviate the suffering of OCD patients. Believe me, a lot of OCD patients could be really helped if we can help them practice negative capability. Again, the state of knowing and not do knowing and, and not be conflicted to get into that ritual, either of washing hands or cleaning their face or uh, running around the circle a uh, hundred times or to count from one to hundred or hundred to one, like for hours together, um, hoping that, uh, or, or thinking that if they don't do that, one of their parents will die or the house will catch fire. So these are debilitating con conditions. There's a lot of suffering that's happening in OCD. Some of them silently suffer, others suffer, and they become really debilitated. Uh, I'm, not, not, I'm not talking about mild OCD, uh, as in checking the locks uh, or checking the gas uh, 10, 15 times. Uh, yes, that is something to be concerned about, but not a whole lot. So let me go to the next one. This is a schematic representation of 360 feedback. This is the tool that we created. Uh, look at authenticity, comfort with ignorance, patient observation, reserving judgment, tolerance for ambiguity, servant leaders, and empathy. So when you're using 360 feedback, we want our leaders to uh, demonstrate these, these qualities, these attributes, authenticity, comfort with ignorance, et cetera, et cetera. Because all of them feed into this negative capability frame of mind. Uh, all right, so enough about that. Uh, redefining negative feedback. Now, 200 years later, you know, as you know, Keats uh, formulated this expression in 1815. So what happens now? That was 200 years ago. Is it even relevant today? Is it germane to, to our context today? When I started out this presentation about an hour ago, I was talking about, we are all thrust into this highly uncertain time, this, endem this uh, pandemic where we just don't know how things will be. And it's not no longer about, hey, so I'm gonna pick up the virus and I'm gonna get a cold or a cough or a respiratory uh, type of uh, ailment, and then I'm gonna get better. There's a risk of dying from this. So, you know, who wants to deal with that? And people are going through a lot of psychological uh, anxiety, a lot of tension. Uh, they just don't know how they, I mean, people are losing jobs. Millions of people have applied for unemployment benefits. So what do we do? Nearly 200 years after its coinage by a romantic poet in his early 20s, negative capability continues to be raised by scholars to a canonical status. It's been raised to a canonical status. There is no finality. It raises more questions than it provides answers. And that is the beauty of this uh, phenomenon. Um, it may be that in postmodern times, we need to think of negative capability as a state of questioning. So we all need to be in that frame of questioning and allow ourselves to be guided by inquiry while resisting the temptation to seek answers. In attempting to understand something by reaching for the doctrine of knowledge, we are taking flight to the world of certitude that is ephemeral at best. So when I said ephemeral, it's fleeting, it's temporary, uh, and, and, and you cannot be in that paradoxical dilemma for any length of time. You really need, uh, you have to be able to get out of it. But it, unless you're able to practice that, that, and it takes a tremendous amount of patience and perseverance and understanding and compassion um, into the world of others and empathic consideration uh, to be able to practice that. Uh, Bachelor, he's a, he was a, a Zen Buddhist scholar in the UK, suggests where there is great questioning, there is great awakening. Where there is little questioning, there is little awakening. Where there is no questioning, there is no awakening. Perhaps in contemporary times, staying in the present without regressing to the past or fleeing into the future is all that we can learn to do. So in other words, it may well be that just remaining in the present or, or, or attaining the capacity to remain in the present and see whatever it is that we are dealing with in the present without, while resisting the temptation to go to the past or run into the future. So, so remaining in the present is also a refrain. You know, it's, it's challenging to be in the present state of mind. 
but that is what negative capability uh, you know suggests that we do this was just something that i made out of the mud of chaos uncertainty and doubt grows the lotus unstained as it were by certitude and the doctrine of knowledge um, so we need to be in that state of chaos uncertainty and doubt which we always are going to be at some level or the other just like the lotus grows out of slush and grime and dirt and filth such a beautiful flower that comes out of it we need to be in that frame of mind okay so with that uh, i come to the end of my presentation here are some selected references i'm not going to go through the list uh, it's all part of that and um, i will be happy to uh, share with anybody who wants a copy of my uh, powerpoint presentation incidentally this is the exact PowerPoint that I used in my doctoral dissertation uh, in 2014. And by the way, my doctoral dissertation, the live uh, session uh, has been, um, uh, was recorded and it's uploaded to my YouTube channel also. But I wanted to really share this with others because you know, when you're doing a dissertation, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of technology hiccups and everything else. I wanted this to be straightforward and simple and go step by step and throw in and and also this was a way for me to know what was what is it i've learned about negative capability uh during the last six years uh so that's for you to figure out but it's also for me to see what progress i've made uh and uh if you'd like to contact me uh my email and if you want a power PowerPoint presentation, my email is at abehal, A-B-E-H-A-L, A-B-E-H-A-L at email.fielding.edu. I'm also available to coach, guide you on the use and deployment of anomalology and IPS. So if you're pursuing MPhil or you're pursuing a PhD and uh, you are planning to do phenomenology or IPA, I'd be very, very happy to work with you as your guide, uh, as an external advisor on your committee. If you would like, um, please contact me and I will be happy to work with you. With that, I want to wrap up this presentation and thank each and every one of you that is taking the time to read and also to uh, listen to my, my presentation. It's been a rather longish um, presentation, but I hope that you got something out of this. And um, uh, with that, good luck and please stay safe. Uh, uh, take care of your families and please uh, make sure you provide enough social distance so that, uh, you, you know, you're not endangering your life and the lives of others. Okay. Okay. Goodbye.